Eric, is it just the way that we think that we're wearing the same color shirt, or is it just that there's three primary colors and so we lucked out? Which one is it? I would say it's hard to say. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with that we have a, a spiritual connection that, mm-hmm. that transcends uh, time and space. This is Interstellar Lifting Edition. Um, I just want to say that the person that corrected us about stuck together, which is apparently stuck on you, we already explained what happened there, was very gracious in accepting our correction of his statement. Um, and in that way, you know, we like to, we are right now kind of in a bubble, Eric and myself, okay? Uh, and that bubble is not meant to be perturbed under any circumstance. We're inviting two people on today to talk about hybrid lifting. And we've been told that that does not mean hybrid does not imply bodybuilding, both classic and physique, which up until this point in time, Eric, was my understanding. The t- the two sports. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's I feel like such a broad skill set is required to do both mm-hmm. uh, classic and and actual bodybuilding. Um, this is something very few people understand. You know, there's Eric Trexler, uh, Derek, Derek Trexler, Aaron, yeah. I don't can't remember. Yeah. Uh, myself, yeah. you, yeah. Uh, in spirit at least, and, yeah. and a few others. Yeah. Um, actually, who we had on the current, you know, classic physique, Mister Olympia, actually competed as bodybuilding before. You know, the veritable Bo Jackson of our times. Yeah. Um, but uh, but but yeah, this is I guess filler you know, episode. I hate to say. It's 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 a no less accurate view of what a multi sport athlete mm-hmm. might be when we're talking to both Max Ada and Steffi Cohen. Uh, you know, Max has a lot of athletes training for the super total, mm-hmm. the big five, if you will, not the well known sporting goods store, uh, but squat, bench, deadlift, snatch, and clean and jerk. Uh, while Steffi Cohen, having a background in uh, in CrossFit, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, is helping uh, a lot of people who, in our modern times. Uh, are doing a little more than just trying to fix being ugly or trying to do the squat bench and deadlift because that's who uh, you know they follow on Instagram. They're actually interested in a more holistic approach to uh, to global conditioning, functional fitness, strength, and also looking the part. So yeah, it's it's a different perspective than you know classic plus regular bodybuilding. Yeah, we're but, not saying yeah. one's better than the other, but hey, you're listening to us, so we already know what the correct conclusion is. I will say it was great having Steffi Cohn. She's known for having, you know, 20, 30 world records. Also talk shop. The principles were, you know, she went to school. She's a physiotherapist, I believe it is. She's well-versed when it comes to talking about these things. Max, his credentials, the jug life. Uh, yes, Max, I'm one of the seven listeners to that. So to get two people that haven't really met each other, but then we find, Eric, interestingly enough, that there's a lot of common ground with the way that they approach programming. And then to hear from them, yourself, talk about something more to lifting other than being really, really ridiculously good looking or also being very Mm. strong, how that buy-in, the uh, buy-in for a long-term lifter, hearing some of the people that have been in this sport for such a long period of time, I think it's going to resonate for everyone. Even if you're just a casual lifter, you think to yourself, you know, we kind of put on our tribal identity. Uh, Eric, I'm a power lifter. I'll always be a power lifter. I'm like, well, two years ago, you never picked up a barbell in your life and suddenly you're all about this life. It's just very interesting to hear these different perspectives from well-seasoned veterans that also coach a lot of people. So they're not just talking out of their ass. Yeah, this is it's a really cool discussion. And, you know, my, my, my joke about fixing ugly is, is a historical reference to how physical culture changed and became what uh, our, our, our guest and my good friend Chip Conrad called the, the fitness and industrial complex to where basically the tagline is, you're ugly, we can help, as he puts in his book. Um, and, and this is essentially what... Uh, you mentioned how these are people with a different background. They hadn't met. This is them, them meeting for the first time on Skype. But because they have both been pursuing and helping others pursue strength in a more holistic sense across multiple disciplines, they've had certain uh, uh, strategies and philosophies and mindsets emerge from the necessary, the necessary components of not being hyper-specialized on any given one uh, topic, and I think this is a, not only just a cool insight into what does it take to to, to train for a super total or to look like a bodybuilder uh, and be as powerful as a weightlifter and as strong as a powerlifter, uh, like like uh, Steffi's company Hybrid tries to help people achieve. But it also gives an insight into the dangers of being in a bubble 
Um, I mean, there is one bubble that there's no danger of being in because it's always correct, and that's me and you. That's a safe um, bubble. You know, stuck together, just like the classic movie that is now canon, regardless of what it was actually called. But yeah, yeah. for other bubbles, you know, not ours, the risk is not being aware of what's outside of it, and for those bubbles to create an echo chamber. Uh, and that's something we discuss uh, a little bit in this episode as well. So there's a lot to take home here philosophically in terms of mindset, uh, even understanding programming principles like volume, intensity, specificity, and variation, and some actual X's and O's, which I thought was really cool. There's a lot jam-packed into this episode. Oh, it's a power episode. Okay, 70 minutes of power. of And, and, and strength. <clears throat> and aesthetics. Uh, you know, it has everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's got it all. So tune in, folks. We've got Max Ada, Steffi Cohen, talking about training as a multidisciplinary strength athlete. You know, uh, Eric, I am just honored to be joined by fellow uh, lifters of multiple sports. Let's call them hybrid lifters. Both myself and Eric, uh, we do bodybuilding two ways. We do it uh, physique and we also do classic. So we know what it's like to do multiple sports at once. And we're just thrilled to have individuals that might do Eric, what it, I, I keep uh, mistaking what they do is it's weight. What what was the sport they do? It's it's a, a weightlifting Olympique. Mm. It, it's uh, it's it's the the original uh, the one. It's I think it, you know how you know you, you know you go to Thanksgiving and your parents are like hey do you lift weights and they do this one yeah um it's, they actually do this one oh. right so yeah and I, I've heard Steffi uh, does some of the uh, I think there's the 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 big the big three four three three the squats uh, there's the one where you you die and then there's the one where you lay down um, so and I've heard that Max might also do some of those but I think they lift weights it's all the same right yeah yeah just uh, one one quick question uh, Max I saw you squat um you know just like beltless walk up to it I think it was like six hundred something of like California strength out of curiosity why didn't you decide to do that at Gold's Gym because we are a bodybuilding centric podcast just curious why. There wasn't like a stringer, a tank top, or, or shirtless when you did it. It was it was a great feat of strength. Don't get me wrong. The old, the old stringer hoodie? Mm-hmm. Crop top. Crop top. I don't think I've ever even been into a bodybuilding gym until after 2016. That's just what we had. That's what we had. That's all we had in Montana. Growing up, all we had was like the old cinder blocks and, and rusty like car tires. And that's how we trained. Is that where you grew up? Uh, yeah, I was born in Montana. Yeah, okay. that was a joke. We did have like decent equipment, but it wasn't it wasn't that big a stretch. It wasn't that big a stretch. I come from Venezuela, so for me, I was like, all right, right. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's just like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. What's your PR? Sounds uh, reasonable. Two spare tires and a cinder block. That was my bench PR for a few years. <laughs> So you're both well equipped to also do strong men or strong women because that's basically some of the actual events. I love it. Nice. <laughs> so without without further ado, um, Steffi Cohen, welcome back. Second time on the podcast. It's been a while. Um, it's an our honor to have you, Max. I'm going to say long time listener, first time guest, and I do not want you to correct me. Um, mm -hmm. And we're just going to go with that. But if you could, at first, let me just say thank you for coming on the podcast. Could you introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Max Ada. I was a, was a mediocre lifter and a, a decent coach. Um, coach weightlifting, powerlifting for, I don't know now, about, I don't know, hold it now, probably about 15 years or so. Been involved in it for maybe 20-ish. I love it. Yeah. And so I, I think the reason why we bought both, both brought both of you on, so Steffi, obviously hybrid coaching, there's the, the specific implicit subtext there that you help people look like a bodybuilder, move like a weightlifter and get as strong as a powerlifter. I'm sure I'm messing that up slightly and I'll let you correct me. Yeah. And then Max, I nailed it. Yeah. Yes. All right. That's the first win of many. Uh, you'll, you'll see that a broken clock is right twice <laughs> per day, and Eric Helms is right once per podcast. So I'm not even on broken clock level, but that gives me something to strive for. Um, Max, I know you do a lot of specifically super total coaching for Juggernaut. So can you tell us a little bit what is a super total? Why is it super? And, uh, and how do you get such a total? 
Uh, it's a combination of weightlifting and powerlifting. So you have, you know, like the way the way the program is set up is done where there's like an emphasis on weightlifting one cycle or part of the year and then emphasis on powerlifting part of the year. Uh, and then, you know, those those kind of rotate back and forth. And then maybe once in that yearly long term plan, we'll have a competition, you know, specific like a, a super total meet where people would go and do snatch, clean jerk, squat, bench press, bench press, deadlift. And that's like a one one cycle a year kind of thing that we train for. So in the context of like being great at any being great at all of them all the time. We can do that a little bit, being good at one of them some of the time, uh, and being decent at them all the time. That's kind of the goal with it. I love it. I think the the reason why I wanted to have this podcast on is because it's this almost seems like a novelty to people today, the idea of combining these sports. But if we were to take a historical look at things, uh, weightlifting used to be a three lift sport. It used to have the clean and press and it had a slow speed strength component. Um, and even, uh, prior to that, prior to, to powerlifting become an actual sanctioned specific sport in the, I think the first big competition was 64, if I recall correctly. And it was formed in the late fifties. Uh, it was just called the odd lifts. And it was a collection of lifts that, that bodybuilders and weightlifters did, uh, as supplementary movements to, to help their, their weightlifting lifts and is to build their overall physique. So it's, it's this almost this return to where we used to be. Um, but it's become basically more of a science now. Um, and I, I don't mean that in a sense that, you know, scientists are doing it, but more so, uh, I mean that because we've gone through the super specialization of weightlifting and the super specialization of powerlifting, trying to get the best of both worlds has become more of a balancing act than previously, where it seems that this is just kind of what people did. So, um, Max, I'd love to hear a little more about what do you find are the unique challenges for someone who is trying to be good at these five lifts? Uh, and, and what does that, that, that juggling look like from a macro level? You know, I mean, the, the, the fundamentals of all of our programming always kind of stem from the scientific principles and the obviously specificity being the most significant kind of puts this weird lens over the entire process because super total meets aren't really like a sanctioned thing. It's not a, it, it in and of itself is not a sport per se at the same level that powerlifting and weightlifting are. Um, maybe one day there'll be, you know, super total events. I mean, there are some, but they're, they're essentially just like, you know, stapling together a, a USAW meet, a USAPL meet, or all of them together in one day or something like that. So it's a, that kind of, you know, understanding is like, Hey, specificity is going to be something that we are kind of inventing this sport inventing this, this challenge to, to sort of train for. So that always kind of plays a role in it, uh, designing the training programs, right? Sometimes of the year, we're going to have a lot more general phases because we aren't necessarily going to peak for snatch and clean and jerk when we're going into a powerlifting competition, right? And vice versa. So, so our program looks a lot more general throughout the whole year because we don't have the same goal every single competition, right? Uh, so we have like a program that looks just less specific you know, in terms of the total volume in yearly reps than like, say like a weightlifting or powerlifting program. The other thing is uh, fatigue management is huge for super total because, you know, doing huge powerlifting kind of competitions uh, on a regular basis and trying to also be good at weightlifting or is, it's not contradictory, but it's difficult, right? You, the, you know, you squat and deadlift for huge volumes of training, which is great for squat and deadlift you're going to start to slow down for weightlifting. So your technique and your quality of movement is going to degrade a little bit. So those things have to be kind of accounted for in that medium term programming, right? Where, where you're, you know, short, you know, four to six week block kind of stuff really is important in the short term, like, you know, weekly structure things where things start to get really intricate, right? You have to be you know, aware of how many different options there are to actually assign exercises during the week. You know, you've got seven days or 10 days, however long your microcycle is. And you have to be smart about like, okay, well, what days can we bench press on? 
And where are the jerks going to fall relative to that? Or where is snatching going to fall relative to that? And anyone who's done, you know, I'm sure Steffi knows very well, anyone who's bench pressed huge weights, snatched, including jerks, huge weights, like, you know, really in close proximity, there's going to be a, you know, some sort of negative influence from one to the other. Um, whether it's minor for some people, whether it's major for others, you have to take that into account. But that's kind of the the biggest the biggest hurdles for building a program like that is to really put those pieces together and and finding you know templates and structures and, and combinations of these this organization that works well enough that the program can be productive without being uh, sort of like un uh, too difficult to perform right if it's really radical and like hey you got to do you know, I want you to train every other day and that includes Sunday, but then take Monday off and then you need to do this and this weird stuff where like, yeah, that logically makes sense on paper, but who wants to go in the gym and this weird schedule, it doesn't make sense to them. Right. So I think there's all these kind of, you know, how do you, how do you piece together something that really makes sense and still is principle based? You're not in violation of anything too great. You're not, uh, you know, just kind of justifying excess volume here and there for no reason. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of, I would say, the biggest the biggest hurdle with all putting all together. That's a really cool perspective. It sounds like you need to balance complex variables with the simplest approach possible right. and make sure that everything you're doing is actually intentional, where maybe if you were just focusing on three lifts or two lifts, you could be like, ah, eh, maybe I can do X accessory. But in this case, you're looking at, well, okay, how can my big three be considered an accessory for my, for my other two or vice versa? Uh, how can I kill two birds with one stone or at least not have to, to, to make the least amount of sacrifices right, possible? And that right. makes a, a lot of sense. That's cool. Um, Steffi, I want to kick it over to you now. With, with hybrid, um, I want to know... Do you find yourself working with a lot of uh, CrossFitters, uh, competitive athletes, people with more intrinsic goals that kind of encompass aesthetics, strength, and, and performance? Or who is the typical person who you find doing this juggling act for? We honestly, we work mainly with general population. Uh, mm -hmm. Our demographic tends to be people who get tired of CrossFit and tired of being pulled in many different directions. That would be like the typical hybrid athlete, the person who would join hybrid performance and try to do Olympic <laughs> in politics and bodybuilding. That one, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a little bit less conditioning that still wants to look good and still enjoys doing the Olympic lifts. That would be kind of the the, the typical hybrid athlete. Usually, mm -hmm. um, we don't get a lot of uh, traditional sport athletes. We would say like a, a handful or, or a small percentage of them are traditional athletes, but just mainly just your average gym goer that is wanting to look better naked, is wanting to feel good, move better and, and be strong. I think that's that's actually a really useful juxtaposition because I think, and I, Max, I don't, I don't want to speak for your clientele, but you're, you're dealing with competitive powerlifters and weightlifters who are trying to do both, probably generally more intrinsically motivated athletes because they're kind of self-creating this goal. Um, and then on the other end of that spectrum, Steffi, you guys are working with more people who have non-competition goals, but are trying to do a lot of things at once. And I think we're in this kind of cool phase of uh, the weightlifting world and or, or the strength world, if you will, um, where it's not just about looking a certain way or being really, really strong on specific lifts. I think CrossFit's changed the face of things. There's a little more holism to what people are interested in. And it's great that you're providing, um, you know, coaching specific to that, that changing cultural environment of strength. So I guess for you, you're juggling many of the same things that Max is, but you aren't bound necessarily by competition dates. So what does your style of programming typically look like from kind of a high level when you're dealing with the folks you train? Yeah, so um, initially I did, we did start hybrid with the intent of competing in super totals. And then I actually participated in a super total and was like, no, <laughs> no this is absolutely brutal. I cannot imagine putting people through this. Seriously, have you, have you guys ever done one? I have done a gym gym super total on my own, and I am a crazy yeah. person, but I, I have not actually look, competed. I've done half marathons. I've done triathlons. I've done CrossFit competitions. I've done Go Rucks, and that was the most difficult event I've ever done. 
it was so <laughs> brutal. You know, it required so much focus and strength and, and strong mindset that I don't know. I just and then I was done for like two weeks after that. Was so, it all on the same day or was it yeah, back to back it. days? Oh, my um, God. Yeah. Yeah. Those <laughs> ones are awful. <laughs> wow. Um, so that kind of turned me off from the idea of even encouraging people to do Super Turtles. Obviously, if that's something that people want to do, like the one ton challenge, obviously, I'm all for it. It's doable, like Max said. But, um, you know, for us and for me, the more that I've developed, the more that I've matured as an athlete and the more that I've let my kind of education dictate the principles that I program by is I like to focus on health because I think that, you know, a lot of people get really impatient and focus on, okay, I want to squat 400 pounds, deadlift 500, whatever. And they forget that in the absence of health, strength can't exist essentially, right? Like you can't try to put 500 pounds on your back if you're not, if, if you're not in good health. So part of the approach of hybrid is incorporating principles and incorporating exercises, movements, and periodizing in such a way that allows people to move and feel like a human. Obviously directed towards the goal, right? Like I'm going to periodize the load to make sure that you're getting stronger in certain periods or you're getting stronger in the lifts that you are going to compete in. But at the same time, I'm, I'm placing an even bigger and larger focus on making sure that you're feeling well. Because right. I think that's something that we we really we really lose track of when we are hyper focused on a specific goal. So obviously health is one of the pinnacles there. And then the second one is in especially for all of our training programs, we offer like 16 or 17 different programs. The backbone, how I like to call it, of all of our programs, it's always strength. So mm -hmm. independently of you doing an Olympic weightlifting cycle or a power or a CrossFit or a functional training cycle or whatever it is that you're doing, we place an emphasis on strength because we're big proponents on um, just always kind of having a strength surplus to be able to power the other movements that you want to do. So, for example, the way I look at Olympic weightlifting movements, uh, such as the snatch and the clean and jerk, those are skill movements and technical movements. Those are not power output movements. So I think that was the, the, the first kind of realization that I had going from having a Bulgarian style uh, coach. You know, my coach was from Cuba and was very Bulgarian style. We trained nine times per week, you know, snatch, clean, jerk, snatch, clean, jerk, snatch, clean, jerk every day. Uh, and for me, it was switching to powerlifting and dialing down on the snatching, clean, and jerk once I was already proficient. Right at that point, I had already been training for three or four years pretty seriously. And I noticed, oh, okay, if I get my strength up, then that might help in my in my snatch clean. You're gonna actually don't need to practice them that much because I've acquired that skill already. What I need is to gain general strength so I can power those movements essentially. Because there's no point of banging my head against the wall trying to fight for a, for a 0.3 pound PR on the snatch when my front squat is five kilos below my or above my clean, right? So right. obviously there is. Um, the law of diminishing returns applies here. Some people don't need more strength. The perfect example is Fernando Ruiz, who trains at my gym. You know, that guy can squat like 380 and pull like 360. That guy's good. He doesn't need any more strength training, right? He might need mobility. He might need general health. He might need some conditioning, you know, to get through his sessions. But um, I don't know where I was going with this. But ultimately, yeah, it's about... <laughs> it's about um, being able to apply all of these different principles into a program, recognizing that health is the most important thing and uh, keeping strength as your backbone. I love it. That's the, uh, uh, you, you know, go ahead, Max. I was going to say, well, uh, to Steffi, that's kind of cool that you had a, uh, a Bulgarian coach and you, uh, when I was young, I trained with Ivan Abijayev and uh, um, it's, it's cool to hear that kind of listening to you say the exact same things I remember where you're like, yeah, you snatch, clean, and jerk maximum two times, three times a day, every day, every week, and then you feel weak. And you're like, yeah, if I was just a little bit stronger. And I'm like remembering back to those times, like, yeah, like I remember like doing like 12 sessions a week or something at the end of the week. And you're just like, 
you know, I clean 170 or something, but I couldn't deadlift 180 or whatever. And you're just like, man, if I, I wonder what would happen if I did some like RDLs or some bodybuilding, like, but of course then I never did. So I was, I was always that like wondering, you know, I could have been, I could have been good if I had done something different, but it's funny right. to hear you say the exact same thing. And, and, you know, like that's a cool story. Well, yeah, from, and I'll tell you from my personal experience, transitioning in, in that kind of in between hybrid period that I had, where I was still trying to compete in weightlifting and in mm-hmm. powerlifting. As soon as I, because it's like, a, I actually spoke about this with uh, with Sebastian Orib yesterday. It's like uh, training blue balls. Like I'm literally <laughs> for four years, I didn't really test my right. strength. I was only accumulating volume, accumulating, accumulating, accumulating 80, 85, 90%, like never touching that 100%. And the second that I was let go and actually started focusing on strength, Obviously, squat and deadlift went through the roof, right. and then my clean even went through the roof. I think I got like a 10 kilo clean PR after right, right. a six month long uh, strength cycle. So obviously, I don't, you know, approaches are highly individualized. I, I, I would never dare to generalize um, the, the the results that I had from that particular style of programming to everyone, you know. But it, it goes the same for any other training style right you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily say that the bulgarian system would work for everyone and in mm-hmm. fact it works yeah. for very yeah. people yeah, right very Most people when they try that approach so it's just something that worked for me um and that i i'm i'm very cautious on how i talk about it and how i program it because i just recognize the the art of coaching and the individualized aspect of programming in such a way yeah, I was just going to say, man, I, I think uh, I wonder, Eric, if there's any research taking a look at long term investment amongst lifters when they have a multitude of goals versus more of a singular goal. Um, I'm just thinking of ourselves. And I spoke about this before, like circa 2012 or 13, I came up kind of with that line of athletic aesthetic, like kind of looking good, but being able to move. And just the idea that you reach a certain point as a lifter and why I think both of these approaches, kind of the hybrid approach, I immediately see the appeal is that at a certain threshold of lifting after five years, six years, seven years, you know, you're not getting necessarily a PR every few months in any of the big lifts. And so you have this wide multitude of goals. And as a result of that, it's like you might do a year and your squat kind of stays the same. Your bench press might stay the same. Your deadlift might squeak up a little bit. It's like, well, wait, there's all these other strength sports. Why am I not experimenting with this as well? It's like, you know, the novelty of doing something new or cycling back or even the concept of block periodization to come back. Or it's like, you know what, man? It's like, I haven't seen my abs for a while. Like I, with Eric's help last year, where I had some strength goals, they're going all right. And then just seeing, honestly, Eric in person, and this isn't even me being funny. I'm like, this guy looks great. And I know the man's natural. It's like, let's try and aspire towards this. It's time to lean down, bro. And so literally, Eric, we were training together in uh, Sacramento and I made that pivot where I'm like, you know what? (laughs) I didn't tell you this, but we both had our shirts off at Alan's gym. I was like, you know, I'm, I think I'm a little bit higher of a body fat than I first estimated my friend. And so it's nice to pivot though with the goals. And then that buying the asceticism that myself and Eric were disciples of this guy called uh, Dave Draper was, uh, was just reinvigorating. And then that actually launched for myself. I'm speaking now personally uh, for my a- own anecdotal experience, but I see this in kind of how you talk about your clients or the methodology or both of you, when you said, you know, Bulgarian styles training where it's hyper specific, it's like, we're going to do the one thing and we're going to do a shit ton uh and we're just gonna see if your body breaks that i got reinvested back into strength lifting after the fat loss phase was over so i immediately see like uh max with you like kind of combining for that super total powerlifting and weightlifting and then steffi for yourself where you add that aesthetic component um i probably want to continue along because yes steffi i see that bandana looking great that i can't help but notice from not even a marketing standpoint maybe it's just the innate uh, motivation one feels when they see someone looking pretty damn jacked. I think of the weightlifter, honestly, Klokov, who probably did more in the West to get more lifters involved in some capacity with weightlifting because they may, maybe they made the erroneous correlation like Klokov's jacked, he does weightlifting, therefore I do weightlifting, I'm going to get jacked, versus Ilya Ilyan. You know, Ilya's my boy, he's the fridge, and he'll always remain my boy. He takes his shirt off, I'll just leave it at that, Eric. I don't want to say anything negative about my man, you know? 
Uh, but talk to me then about the aesthetic component, both maybe uh, marketing, how it might assist in terms of like, you know, you, you might sell someone up front on the, hey, you want to look good. And then you're kind of like shoehorning underneath it. Like, here's the health components. Here's some of the mobility stuff. Oh, also strong is kind of sexy. It's empowering all these things. So how do you... Uh, how do you shape then the program for someone in terms of the language you convey to get someone to have that buy-in and then they stick in that hybrid process and they become, let's say, like a hybrid athlete and they're in it for years? Like, what does that look like? So I, I want to attack that question, but before I forget, um, on the topic of of uh, doing, and Eric, I've heard you talk about this actually on your book, I think, the concept of adherence being probably the most important concept of or variable as far as following a training program, right? Like there's no training program that's going to work if you don't adhere to it. And ultimately you're not going to adhere to a program you don't like and you don't enjoy. Obviously, you know, there's the, the, the warriors or the Navy SEALs type characters like myself who initially started that like no pain, no gain mentality. You know, I don't care if it hurts. I don't care if I don't like it. I'm still going to do it. But look, that catches up to you eventually, no matter how much passion, no matter how much love you have for the sport. And I tell you, because I'm there, I've been there and I'm there now. And I never thought I was going to be one of those people that like that whines or gets tired of pushing. And it's because of that reason that I think it's so important to gam gamify training. And that's a concept that a lot of people are talking about right now, right? Just having fun and enjoying your training. And I'm not saying have fun and enjoy your training four weeks out of a meet because then like, you know, what are you doing? I'm saying, all right, you're six, eight months out of your meet. Hey, grab a baseball bat. Go, I don't know, throw a football, go take a boxing class, man. You're good. You're eight months out of a meet. Have some fun with your body. Okay. And I think that's a huge problem. Like there's no way that you can possibly adhere to any training, any training for, for, for a long enough period of time to make significant progress um, if you're if you're not enjoying yourself and if your body's broken. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah, one point I wanted to make. And then that's to answer... A, oh, sorry. I was going to say that's that's one of those, like, the, the idea of, like, variation, right? Where, where a lot of us, a lot of people see variation as, like, oh, it's a new exercise or maybe a little bit different variation on sets and reps. And, and specificity and variation are two, two sides of the same coin, right? Where if you have this overexposure to specificity, this overexposure to the same consistent stimulus again and again, even though there may be significant enough overload or enough stimulus to generate results, it starts to become psychologically demanding, right? It becomes monotonous and boring and, and you know, overtraining kind of sets in. And the idea of variation being used in bigger chunks where variation from you know the entire mindset and and this this sort of exposure to novel stimulus but not just oh it's a different day we try a new exercise we're still doing you know squat bench deadlift monday wednesday friday snatch clean and jerk tuesday thursday it's just different flavors of them you're doing a totally different thing you know um you know like you said like boxing or, or whatever you know some completely different you know transitional period and it's funny because i think a lot of people in all of these sports are and especially in this country as a culture it's very much like work 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 you know go hard the whole time we've lost sight of the idea of like transitional or restorative periods of training where you know after big competitions there there needs to be this you know period of time that allows for like a restoration of the physical qualities but also the mental and emotional qualities where you walk away from training and you're giving yourself the gift of missing it where you you walk away and suddenly you're like you're ready to train so then you hold off a little bit longer till you're really chomping at the bit to train again and then you're you're refreshed mentally and and i think that that kind of you know in in this like you're saying right the like navy seal mentality this like macho super tough hardcore culture sometimes you end up where people think that that kind of training or those kind of periods of time are a waste. You know, if you're not if you're not you know constantly working towards your goal, you're not going to get better. And the reality is, you know, usually it's the opposite, right? When you take these transitional periods to to recuperate and to totally, you know, recover from all of the things you're doing and being you know coming back from that period ready to train, you end up further ahead than you would have before. Absolutely, I could not agree with that anymore. Like. I think that's one of the most common mistakes a lot of people make, right? Is they come out of the, the competition and they immediately get back to the gym yeah. one month, bitch deadlift. 
it's so crazy to me. It really is. How many times have we seen, like, you guys probably see, like, the, the power lifter life cycle, like, new power lifter starts day one and, you know, hammers their way through seven meets by 18 months in, then they get one injury and then it's over and then they quit, right? And it's like, that happens all the time. And, like, new lifters where it's like, you're brand new, you're three years in and you're already, like, retired. Um, and that probably just comes from, you know, like, burning out because you're just, it's like, you just slow down, right? Like treat it like more of a, a, a cyclical thing, like kind of a sport, right? There's like a, there's a season in the year where it's like, let's make this a hardcore thing. and us really push for everything. And there's a season where it's like, hey, this is, this is not a, a, a time to be worrying about, you know, building up your squat. You know, in fact, maybe there's, maybe blasphemy, there's a couple of months where you don't do squats uh, in the yearly cycle. <laughs> yeah. Because look, what happens when you, when you come out of a, a, a peak or you just compete it? You are at your peak, probably performance uh, as far performance level as far as powerlifting goes in terms of strength. But you are, my friend, at the bottom of the hell yeah. uh, pyramid. You cannot walk a flight of stairs without losing your without losing your breath. You know, you probably are, you your range of motion probably sucks. You're stiff. You're not in shape. You know, it's I feel so bad when I'm done with a meet. I'm like, oh my god, I'm in the worst yeah. shape of my life. Right. But yeah. I'm in strength shape, but I'm in the worst human shape. Yeah. It's not yeah. a good place. Yeah. So yeah, you guys are both echoing some things that I've I've heard from some of our former guests. We've had both Dan John and also Chip Conrad on. Mm. Um, and Dan John's been around forever. Um, and I mean that as a sign of respect, and not a knock at his age if he's listening. Um, <laughs> And, you know, his background coming from uh, learning to lift in the 60s, uh, having been a thrower, uh, Highland Games, and then um, also competing in, in powerlifting and weightlifting himself, and then coaching a tremendous number of athletes, I think his perspective, the default, is almost uh, kind of what we're getting to now uh, from some of the strength sport that has looked at incorporating more elements. Um, and... Uh, so Dan John has specifically said that after every peak, there's a cliff, you know, and that's exactly what you described, Steffi. You know, you, you peak in one thing, but then everything falls apart and there were sacrifices. There was a cost to specificity. Um, and what uh, Chip Conrad has gotten at is he has taken a very holistic approach to everything. Like um, you guys were talking about the, the mental side of this, how that Navy SEAL mentality is almost treating the body as uh, like the slave you've got to put a chain around it drag it down this this thing and it doesn't matter what you feel like you're getting it done and that's rewarded lauded and even seen as a uh like a, a key character trait of successful athletes and um like you were saying with that powerlifting life cycle i see that as a key character trait of athletes who do not stay in their sport or mm. have this this thing they can recall like oh man i remember back when I was an intermediate lifter, uh, I totally wrecked myself, fell out of love with the sport, and I had to reframe it, and then I came back to it, and then I actually had a sustainable career. Um, and I think in the people who really do have this, like a tremendous willpower and also a tremendous resilience to injury, they can extend that for maybe a decade, but then, man, they're done so. Like, they're, yeah. they're, they're out of it. And I think we've seen those examples. I've seen some of those, those cultures have come and gone. I don't want to... Uh, discount some of the contributions of those cultures as well. But I think West Side is a really good example. Yeah. Um, you know, they almost celebrate injury if you listen to certain people <laughs> who talk about it. Um, and, and then to throw shade on myself, I think bodybuilding culture as a whole, uh, competitive bodybuilding is all about like how much suffering can you endure? And, you know, you'll be hanging out backstage and I've never, literally never been at a show where someone hasn't repeated, you know, the person who looks the best is probably the person who feels the worst. And it's like, oh, oh, oh. but that's like the thing you just always say in bodybuilding. And it used to be something that I would nod my head and relate to. And now I think like, that's, that's, I mean, like, yes, this is hard, but that shouldn't be like the goal, you know? Um, so this goes back to, to me, like the historical roots uh, are, are really the key point here is that when strength was seen as something like the original magazine, like the magazine that, that was the prototype for all of them today, it was called Strength and Health. And those two things wouldn't make sense on the cover of a magazine today with our kind of community's perspective. Like, uh, they're almost antithetical. In Picture some cases. Ronnie Coleman on it. 
Exactly. Right. Like, what, what, do I, what do I put on the cover? Strength and health. I don't get it. Like, you can be super strong and take all these drugs that are going to kill you and then, you know, burn out, but, but shine bright and have something to brag about. That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, but I think at, at a certain point, historically, strength was seen as a quality of the body and an expression of health and form followed function. So, you know, Sandow would display the results of the strength he developed, which was the roots of bodybuilding. Um, and strength and, and strength was was done in the pursuit of health, and all of these movements, like you were talking about, Steffi, were just basically expressions of the underlying qualities. Mm-hmm. And I think today um, you'll see it in like the Instagram questions we get and stuff like that. Hey, I want to train for strength. Do I have to do squat, bench, deadlift? And I'm like, you know, those are expressions of skill that require force production. That's not strength. That is a movement. You're becoming a specialist in movements. And I think that's, that's something that's been lost. Like, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've, I've worked with people, talked to people, answered questions, and tried to break down some of these perspectives of people who think they have to do specific movements rather than seeing them as these are little skill sets that I can apply my body's capabilities towards. And I think that philosophical paradigm shift seems to be something that underpins both of what you guys are talking about. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting yeah. that you mentioned that. What? Uh, so then how would you really measure strength if it's not through skill or power output or in a particular movement? Absolutely. Well, I tell you how we do it in the lab, but that's not very <laughs> useful to, <laughs> to anyone out there. <laughs> But I, I think I think ultimately it, it is measured in however you want to express it. Um, but you know, like we 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 forget that this this little philosophical piece when we you know you see like the bar bend article or the cool thing in Sports Illustrated, like who's the strongest man in the world? Is it uh, is it actually the world's strongest man right now? Is it Half Thor or is it Ray Williams because he can squat that much? Or is is it is it one of the top weightlifters because he's so powerful? And then what if the, he had trained for that sport, you know? And, and then we go back to kind of missing the point. Um, and I think if we view strength as a quality of the body that can be express, expressed through skills, just having that philosophical paradigm understanding prevents you from doing things that I think are counterproductive, like being so specialized that eventually it hurts you, or being afraid to not squat or bench or deadlift or not realizing that perhaps um, the snatch and the clean and jerk work that you're doing is going to have significant carryover to your squat and your deadlift, and you don't have to find some way to make this Frankenstein program that actually just crushes you. So I think that's a great question, and ultimately, Steffi, I believe that, yes, you're, you're going to have to express strength through a movement. It's always quantified in some way, but if we can see it as a quality of the body that expre- is expressed through skills – then we can start leveraging the concepts of specificity and variation in ways that are useful rather than almost these kind of fearful hold tight to our gains ways that that leads to burnout. Yeah, absolutely. I think, go ahead. Oh, I would say it's uh, it's interesting because I think it, it, for me, a lot of it, like it almost parallels like the, the automotive industry where the idea of like, you see like, you know, the sports cars, the Ferrari or something and the technology that exists in, in race cars, right? You know, 30 years, 40 years ago, that stuff was developed and now it trickles down into mom's, you know, uh, minivan, right? And it's kind of the same thing because there's like, there's a lot of people that participate in these sports and participate in these things. And there are the extremes. There are people that are, you know, I mean, Steffi, for example, doing things that no one's ever done before and on a level that, you know, is, you know, tenfold above what most people are, are, you know, considering trying to achieve, right? Aside from the, the random internet troll. But, you know, the, the idea that like, hey, these people are, you know, you, you've, you've made up your mind and your decisions have been, I want to get this thing and it's very specific and it has a, a particular cost that's going to be associated with it. And you're willing to pay the price and do it and get to that level. Um, what you know about training and the things you do to get people to that level, eventually those things trickle down to, you know, uh, more regular folks that are going to start doing these things. So it's it's not so much just like the methods or the means, but the mentality. 
a little bit of Steffi's mentality given to, you know, a, a guy who sits on the couch every day and you know, doesn't want to get up and do whatever, that's going to be really beneficial to him, right? He's never going to have all of her mentality because it's not possible, right? But but the idea that like, hey, this motivation and this this determination, all these things you can do to get yourself, you know, to, to you know, lift these huge weights, those things can trickle down and a little bit of that flavor, a little bit of these things, this hard training, this intensity, these things can trickle down to the regular population and be wholly beneficial, way more so than going into Planet Fitness and doing curls with a nine pound, uh, you know, purple dumbbell, right? So the idea that, you know, what exists on the extreme level can come down a little bit and some little taste of that, a little bit of that stuff can be given to people that are at a different level and and elevate what they're going to get out of it versus the idea that like it's all or nothing. It has to be, you know, hey, when you go in the gym, it's are you going to do an extreme program that has this insane stuff to it? Or is it that, hey, like here's some weightlifting. I mean, that's kind of what CrossFit did, right, is give regular people weight, Olympic weightlifting you know, for the most part in gymnastics, which is something that nobody would have done before. It was not something that was happening in the, you know, the nineties and and whatnot. So it's a, it's interesting to see that like, you know, what can, what can be done at the top levels can also a little bit of that stuff trickles down to these lower levels and it's, it's hugely beneficial. Right. Yeah. Totally agree. I also think, you know, it's, um, it's not necessarily the intensity, what might be detrimental for some people, but the lack of because we talk a lot about periodizing load right like that mm-hmm. that's where the majority of the conversation goes when when we're talking about programming and training and getting stronger we talk about load periodization right. but we honestly we, we don't talk enough about the importance of periodizing your health or your mobility or your uh, your athletic movements and that kind of stuff so i think maybe if we kind of change the narrative a little bit and place importance on that as well and maybe as high level athletes even show what our off-season training looks like so that people understand that it's it's just part of the part of the cycle of an athlete right it's unrealistic for you to expect to be at your peak strength 365 days per year and that was something that I struggled with when I was getting into powerlifting was that anytime after a meet I thought that I had to maintain that level of strength and that level of performance indefinitely to the point where I think my first year, I ran like a, a small of squat, small of squat for a year and a half, like <laughs> in a row. I added like a million pounds to my squat, but it came at a cost. So, you know, just having that discussion and talking about the things that maybe you know are not sexy about training at the high level and and um, off seasons that doesn't get enough press, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, it's interesting. W- one thing that I've really benefited from uh, doing, you know, going to, to AUT to get my education in, in with a, a bunch of, next to a bunch of people who do like their, their PhDs in, in real sports. Like I always tell the funny story that uh, one day I had these three other PhD students around me who are all also working as sports scientists or strength conditioning coaches concurrently with their, uh, their PhD. And uh, there was a gal next to me who was watching game footage from the uh, the soccer team that she was working with, um, there was a gentleman behind me who was doing a, 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 like a biomechanical analysis of landing for some athletes, and he was doing his PhD on ACL repair. Uh, and then I had a rugby coach behind me also looking uh, at an assessment of like a, a movement screen. And then I had a, a, a guy on my screen flexing and then going through quarter turns, and I'm like, we're doing the <laughs> same thing, you know? <laughs> nice, but. Uh, so it, it was funny, and, and it, it led to a lot, a lot of ribbing and joking and good culture building. But the, the really cool thing was that some of the same terms carry different meanings depending on the specific area that you're in. So, for example, when I say periodization, like you said, Steffi, we all think like, oh, I'm manipulating load and volume. When you say periodization to a team sport athlete or team sport coach, they think, oh, I've got to build an aerobic base here an anaerobic base here. I got to do skill stuff here. And then I've somehow just got to basically do whatever training won't break you because we got to play a game every freaking week for the whole season. And it's how do I not lose strength? You know, while you're thinking, I just competed. How do I keep gaining strength from here? Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I, I think it's really useful sometimes to get exposed to other sports. And I think that's one of the main benefits that I'd recommend someone who, if their narrow definition of strength is, you know, squat bench deadlift, just follow some weightlifters, get their perspective. Uh, if you're if you're a bodybuilder and you're thinking about, you know, a variety of movements, but you always think about it from, you know, what muscle am I training today? Well, like, like when you get see the, like the old programs where like, oh, you put the deadlift on back day and then you see these bodybuilders mm-hmm. arguing about whether a deadlift is for your back or your legs. And I'm like, you're not asking the right question at all. You know, you're in an echo chamber arguing about two versions of wrong. Um, so I think it's been it's been really beneficial for me to get that kind of exposure because when I get questions from someone like, hey, is is it behind the neck press? Is that is that is that bad for your shoulders? And I'm like, then all of weightlifting is bad for your shoulders. Maybe maybe that maybe your your premise should be questioned. And these are things that are apparently obvious if you're in and around weightlifters or in and around powerlifters or in and around bodybuilders um, or in and around soccer players uh, or, or sports coaches that you, you simply don't get when you're stuck in one of these narrow silos. And I think that that kind of above the whole question of how do we program, the biggest benefit to me, having been someone who's competed in now strongman weightlifting, powerlifting and bodybuilding is is basically opening my eyes to new programming possibilities. So I don't know, has that been your guys' experience as you've worked across these multiple disciplines? Absolutely. Instead of, you know, and the reason why I was interested in learning more about powerlifting and practicing it myself is because I think there's something to be learned to be learned about each different discipline, right? You have to stay open minded. And understand that, you know, you might be able to pick up certain things from a weightlifter, pick up certain things from a bodybuilder, pick up some, some things from a strongman. That to me is one of the markers of, of good coaching, right? It always raises a red flag when someone is like overly invested in one mm-hmm. particular camp. That is always a red flag. Even in physical therapy, you know, you have the, the McKenzie camp and then you have the ART camp and then you have that. It's like, dude. Why don't you just form your own opinion, all right? Grab techniques from different people and form your own, you know, base it on your personal experience, on your anecdotes, on research, on has, on what has worked for you and on your patients, and then form your own conclusion. So I think instead of dichotomizing uh, training systems and sports is more a matter of, okay, what can I integrate into my training program that will benefit the particular individual that I have in front of me, right? Because like I said, training is individualized. You can't try to put a square peg into a round hole. There's people that are going to benefit from snatching and clean and jerk to improve their, I don't know, football performance. And there's people who that might be extremely detrimental. But by being open-minded and making sure that you have many tools in your toolbox, you just kind of expand your horizons as a coach and, and can assure that it'll help more people. Yeah, I love it. it's it's interesting because a lot of that, like, it's funny how that really is sums up what the super, the you know training for two sports thing, super total or hybrid stuff is. It's the idea that you know you're you're drawing a like you know someone like Klokov, like, well, can he do both sports? Like, yeah, I guess. So I'm going to try and see what happens, right? Um, and so it's kind of neat that the entirety of of the sport itself, or the you know the training for both of these disciplines simultaneously, is is that literally like the definition of what we're just talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I can tell you for a fact that at least from my personal experience, it is very hard to perform uh, at the high level in both Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting. I tried. Mm-hmm. Cool. I tried for a long time and it's really hard. The more you specialize in one, the more it hurts the other. Yeah. And, you know, it, it becomes this like balancing act of trying to get stronger, not losing your mobility, not getting slow. It is very hard. I tried. And like Max was saying, it's it's just it's it's easier to be relatively decent in all of those movements, but it's really hard to be really good at all of them. Mm. So there's this kind of like archetypes too that that come into the sport where you might have somebody who's like like yourself was a good weightlifter, picks up powerlifting easily, or somebody who comes in as a great powerlifter trying to learn weightlifting, totally different, totally different archetypes there. One's going to have much easier time. The other one's going to have a way harder time. You know, and the other, you know, as well, like someone like Misha Kokliev or, or Klokov, like these guys are 
essentially great weightlifters that are super strong and they do some bench presses. Um, you know, neither one of them was like a remarkably good bench presser, but you know, they, they've got basically 90% of the thing. They just have to add a little bit to it. So it's, it's funny to see that when you have those people come in, I've only ever had, I would say only maybe Meg Scanlon was the one, the one athlete that came in with a like triathlete background, powerlifting background and picked up weightlifting going the opposite way, having people that come in as powerlifters and, and pick up weightlifting, you know, to, to a comparable level, uh, is, is so much more rare. Yeah. It seems, it seems to me that the, the characteristics that, that underpin a successful, uh, weightlifter are not just a question of magnitude they're a, they're almost a binary question of, of do you have them or not mm -hmm. and did you develop them early enough um whereas with a power lifter there's very few people who can't get the mobility to meet the technical demands of a squat <laughs> bench or deadlift um and you can simply you know it's it's basically can you get a solid foundation to build on top of um so i'll, I'll speak just if people are wondering who have not done uh, powerlifting or weightlifting concurrently as someone who picked up started weightlifting um, when I was in my late 20s and had been powerlifting and bodybuilding for a while before that getting that foundation to simply do the movements to feel confident building uh, the strength on top of it has been the biggest challenge for me mm. like oh god I don't have the shoulder mobility to uh, to do the snatch all right I'll go wider grip oh now I don't have the shoulder stability to be strong in the overhead position <laughs> You know, or or like, this is great. I can power snatch more than I can snatch because I'm so slow under, but I have a decently strong pull. And if I move to what my body would quote unquote naturally want to do, I'll have a decent power snatch and my snatch will never develop. Um, or I can't flex my abs down and brace while I actually get into full shoulder flexion. So now I have to like hollow out and, and, and extend. So it's it's been this this constant system of I pull one lever and it feels like another one springs out of mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. um, however, if I had started with weightlifting as a teenager, I would probably be carrying certain levels of shoulder mobility and, and uh, technical timing and rhythm uh, that would be necessary to have that foundation in weightlifting, but would not be in the way of me developing powerlifting. So I think in an ideal world, yeah. Uh, you probably want to do weightlifting first if you want to have the the highest ceiling yeah. on both. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that it's, it's it, there's definitely not like there's some rare rare birds out there that for sure are able to pick it up. Um, rare though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say it's it's um uh, you know Hayden and I usually we just test out our test our snatch clean and jerk. Every few, few months, sometimes six months go by. Hayden recently tested out his snatch and came like five kilos below his best, which is just mm -hmm. mind blowing to me. Mind you, Hayden's been doing weightlifting since he was 11. And powerlifting I think for about that's, four years. Uh, that, that actually brings up something I did want to talk to you uh, both about. So we, we've, we've, I think we've, we've gotten into mindset. We've gotten into philosophy. We've gotten very big picture. One very interesting micro thing, which I think you guys would both be in a perfect position to talk about since you both trained Bulgarian style, um, and even with the Bulgarian himself in your case, Max, <laughs> is, um, is that specificity is an extremely powerful tool. And therefore, there have been systems which have leveraged it but when you look at how powerful specificity is, the high frequency, high volume of highly specific work, it's also highly inefficient. And it seems to me to be a very blunt, powerful tool, um, but it can be used the way I would describe it and maybe a much more elegant tool. So for example, I did six months without snatching, did a snatch and I was only five pounds off my max. I've actually experienced that many times, either through injury or with an athlete who hasn't been able to, uh, you know, get access to certain equipment or due to, due to burnout. Um, or I think what we're all probably going to experience when we get back to training after this whole COVID thing is that we may find our strength was a little more resilient or bounce back faster than we ever thought. Um, the doing a, a 
singles every day. You know, like whenever you hear someone talking about working up to a max and doing max multiple times, they immediately go Bulgarian in their head. And they think it's got to be every day, twice a day, multiple times per week, etc. But I've found that some of my kind of default training when I'm trying to master like multiple different movements for maximum force production, like if I'm doing squats, clean and jerk, the big three and some strongman movements, which is kind of my like home base training, is that my default position is just to work up to moderately heavy, heavy singles on a handful of lifts and then be very choosy and picky about what accessory movements or where I want to get my volume. Because even just working up to a, a single at a moderately high RPE, one to two to three times per week seems to be an extremely powerful stimulus to at least maintain something while other things grow or to actually push a lift forward if I'm not that experienced or if it's been a while since I've come to it. So that's that's kind of what I'm getting at with this whole exposure to other philosophies is if you think of doing heavy singles only in Bulgarian style, then it seems to crowd out everything else. It's the only method. There is no volume. It's just high frequency, high RPE singles. But if you can go, hold on, this is a really powerful tool. How can I incorporate it in a different way? Then it opens up new doors. So I, I wanted to hear your guys' thoughts on that specifically and how to use specificity in a way that is maybe more efficient rather than less taking that kind of ultra specific approach. Yeah, we'll start with uh, Max. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think you basically identify what's happening there. In my experience, if you, if you imagine and you understand like the continuum of what maintenance volume equates to at any one intensity zone, so the heavier the weight on the bar, the lower the volume you need to maintain the results of you know those adaptations. So what you end up with is kind of two scenarios in in my experience with the Bulgarian structure is that either you're not at a sufficient enough volume from a total volume aspect or not a su sufficient enough training volume to actually drive results forward. But your intensities are so high that you need very, very little exposure to those work those workouts to maintain results. So you end up in this like either plateau le plateau level or growth level or injury, and then it's time to to rest or or you know you just whatever you get destroyed. You know the for years I trained I trained like that, and I'm sure Steffi could probably even relate to it like. You may go a very long time without losing a lot of fitness, but also without really gaining a lot of fitness. Um, you, you don't necessarily get stronger, you don't necessarily get weaker. You're always kind of struggling with the same numbers again and again. I mean, there was periods of time where I could, you know, snatch a clean and jerk near my maximum for seven, eight months. You know, uh, the, there's no growth in results because there's not a, a sufficient enough overload because we're doing, we're eating up all of our available resources, doing maintenance volume to hold on to the results we have. So we, it's like this catch 22, right? We're shooting ourselves or we're, we're cutting off our nose to spite our face, right? We're, we're never actually in the place where like, hey, we can, we can actually like pull back on the volume and devote it to other things that would, you know, bring our results up. And so the, the, that's sort of like the ultimate like quagmire you get into with the bulgarian system is that without a, a without some kind of injection in the system of volume or some large train uh, change nothing's going to grow you're not going to you're not going to increase you're going to have a really high plateau you're going to hit 90 95% regularly and then the off chance you know great day you hit like a pr or something but it's difficult to have like a, a growth kind of you know, trajectory where, you know, hey, you know, we're training and we, we move up and we move up because we've got sufficient overload and enough fatigue management in place to allow us to do those kind of things. So that was kind of my experience with the Bulgarian system where, where it fell apart. There's plenty of people that are super tough that can train it. And a lot of people ask, you know, uh, people always ask about like the Bulgarian system as though it's this really extreme thing. Like, oh, how did you do it? Or how do somebody do it? And I always found the reality is it's not that it's like anything else, right? You get used to going heavy all the time. Yeah, you feel like shit and you're beat up, but just as much as you would if you were doing, you know, six sets of eight or some shit like that, right? Um, so you get accommodated to what it is. You get used to the kind of struggling and the, the whatever, you know, feelings you have when you're training that way. Outside of that, though, it becomes 
a difficult system to manage because there's a, it's once you step away from the idea of the dogma of what it is and you're like, well, you know what? I should add some volume in here. Then the question becomes, well, okay, if I add some volume, maybe I should also like not do singles all the time. Maybe I'll do a little bit like triples here. Then you start, you take one step away from it. Then you're taking two steps away. Then it's three. And then eventually it's like, well, why am I even doing this? Maybe I should just redesign the program to something that's logical and based on principles, right? Uh, or based on, you know, some other system. And so that always became this, for me, at least like the struggle of it, like, what it is and how it's how it was given to me in in the different forms it was given always led to that question of if i change this and i know that there's five or six good changes that need to happen for it to be a good program or a better program is it still the bulgarian system and if not then then what's the point of like doing halfway in between right why not just go to something that makes a lot of sense that's way way more effective that is a system that is, you know, like the sum of the parts is greater than the whole versus something like Bulgarian system where, you know, the sum of the parts is less than the whole, right? Or vice versa, I guess, on those. But yeah, so that was kind of the, my experience with it, where it's, it's great at maintaining a certain clip, a certain pace and ability level. And there are definitely growth times you can have in it. But for the most part, you know, like like we talked about, like, hey, if somebody goes in the gym and they just do strength training, then out of nowhere they go and they snatch, you know, six kilos under their PR uh, or or whatever, or you know, you're you're always at like 82% of your PR. Those are those are cool scenarios, but the reality is like if you were to say, hey, there's a million dollars in the line at this weightlifting meet, what system are you going to use to train for it? Like, I would probably do a lot of snatches and clean and jerks. Maybe not Bulgarian, but I would probably be like, I want to know what I can do. Even though you're close and you know that, hey, being strong and, and when I was good, like that little bit of like, I want to be more sure and more predictable lends itself to say, well, do I want to do the Bulgarian system and, and have this this sort of like unknown when I'm going to be in good shape, but like I know I can hit this number or do I want to be in a place where, hey, predictably on this day, I know I'm going to be peaked and I'm going to be ready to hit a big number. Totally makes sense. Steffi, any thoughts on that point? Yeah, absolutely. There's absolutely no doubt that specificity matters. Um, you know, you're going to get better. Ultimately, you're going to get better at the movement that you practice the most, right? But I think that specificity is kind of a, a double-edged sword. And the question shouldn't be whether or not specificity matters, but when does specificity matter? I think that's a more important question. Because I think a common mistake for a lot of people, especially beginner intermediate lifters, is to look at an elite level lifter and and ask them what their training looks like now. And obviously my training now looks a lot different than it looked like eight years ago, right? I'm I way more specific than I was eight years ago because I can afford that, right? I can afford to only squat bench deadlift and actually improve. In fact, you see a lot of high-level lifters doing some doing similar programs like that. Yuri Belkin, Mariana Gasparian, they squat one time a week, they lift one time a week, bench twice a week, and that's it. They don't do any accessories for the most for the most part, like in, in, during a peaking block, and that's all they do. But they've already put in the groundwork and they've already accumulated their reps and practiced their sets, etc. So it's not a matter of whether or not specificity is necessary, but when is specificity necessary? When can it? When can it hurt you and when can it make you better, right? So that's part of kind of the way that I that I think about it is part of the pyramid of athletic development, right? A lot of people mm. talk about it as GPP. So what are you doing during the, the, the developmental phases of your athletic career? You know, you see a lot of people going directly from the couch to under a bar. Is that the best mm. approach? Does that person need to specialize? Is specificity important for that person? I'm going to dare to say no. I think that person should be uh, worried about a lot of other things, maybe improving their metabolic conditioning, maybe improving their muscle endurance, their proprioception, their mobility. I can think of about a million things that I would do with that person in parallel to to exposing them to the squat bench and the deadlift if, if that's what they want to do. So is specificity important? Absolutely. But I think it's a matter of being really diligent and cerebral when it comes to when you're going to specialize some, someone. I think 
a lot of people worry way too much about transferability. And that's kind of one of the reasons why they avoid a lot of movements. You see that in weightlifters all the time. Oh, I'm not going to do a low bar squad because it's not specific to the, to the clean or whatever, you know? So how is a back squat even specific to a clean? When, when, when ever in a clean, do you have the bar in your back? Never. Right. So people get so caught up on that, like the specificity and whether this movement's going to transfer or not, that they lose sight of the bigger picture, right? Which is strength is a general adaptation. There are other things that you can incorporate in your program that are inevitably going to make you a better lifter. Mm. There's a couple of things that in my mind emerge from the perspectives you both just gave. If we see specificity as a highly powerful tool um, that increases or I should say decreases the volume needed to maintain an adaptation. And if we see then over the course of not only an individual training cycle or competition cycle, but also the lifespan of a lifter, how specificity can become a little more important at certain times. For example, one of the principles of periodization is basically that, hey, you know, if you do strength and power work um, and then hypertrophy work, if that's generally what we're going to call them, say volume, strength, and power, if we're thinking about typical periodization theory, each phase that comes after the previous one actually is sufficient enough to maintain the prior. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were saying, Steffi, right? Absolutely. So, you know, I may, maybe I spent years doing general bodybuilding and all this general hypertrophy work, put in the reps. Now I have these deeply grooved motor patterns and a lot of skeletal muscle mass. Yeah, I can just do my comp lifts. You know, I've heard uh, translated, but nonetheless, uh, some high, very high level Eastern block lifters. And when asked how much do you, how often and how much do you squat? And they're like, I can clean 400 kilos. I don't squat anymore. You know, I'm, I'm fine. You know, like they, they are, they are similar enough that it, that it no longer matters. And I think what emerges from those perspectives that you guys brought together is that, okay, if my goal is to be say a super total athlete or a strong man or strong woman or a high level CrossFit competitor, that means that I can leverage specificity to maintain, to put pause on certain skills while I emphasize others at, at different times. So for example, what I do with myself is if I'm not actively preparing for a powerlifting competition, but I'm actively preparing for a weightlifting meet, I only got to do a couple of singles a week of the big mm -hmm. three and a fair amount of maybe general accessories to keep my size. And then I'm mostly doing weightlifting, you know? And if I was a more advanced weightlifter, you know, if my, if my clean and my, my clean and jerk and my snatch were more comparable to where they quote unquote should be for my snatch, I wouldn't even have to do some of that other volume accessory work. So I think there is perspective here that you can use specificity to your example with a minimum effective dose, which is normally the question every bodybuilder and powerlifter hates to ask. You know, if you want to know what's the least amount you can do to progress, you're basically a bad person. But now all of a sudden it becomes a relevant question as it can tell you how can I hit pause on the skills that are not immediately relevant either in my athletic career or in this current competition cycle. So I think that's that almost seems to be a side effect of when you try to balance more things, you learn that just by almost an emergent kind of approach to, to doing this. Is, am, I, am I on point here? I see nodding. So I yeah, for sure. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one reason why why the the structure we use is something that that has some sort of rotation to it i mean outside of just the enjoyment of of the variation there's a there's a practical approach to the idea that look you know we the things we're not really going to be focused on here for this training block or cycle are going to be put on maintenance volume loads while everything else is going to be given the most possible training we can give to it and it's something that that until like, you know, one of those kind of concepts, I think that came from the high level is the idea that there's, there's a limited amount of volume, right? There's only so many reps a person can do. Um, when you're brand new to training, you don't really, you don't like conceive of the fact like, oh, I guess you could just, you know, there's only so much training you can actually do that's productive. And being able to distribute that into the, you know, the right places, or at least being able to, you know, that take that budget and balance it in a way that you can give some of that training volume to one sport or one activity for a period of time and then do it to another in a logical way that allows you to actually make progress, you know, on, on two fronts really. And, and, you know, that's kind of the, the ultimate, you know, I guess goal of any periodized program, but 
for supertotal, it becomes especially sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great way to express some of those principles, which I think is, is, is why I would at least challenge some of the readers or readers, listeners who, uh, who are hearing this, if, if they, if they have the capability at some point to try to, to balance a few more things, you'd be surprised that uh, you might learn some things that you otherwise wouldn't have. Um, Steffi, I'm sensitive of, of your time because I, I know we're coming up on, on, on the amount of time you can give us, but do you have any additional thoughts that you want to add to this? I've seen you taking furious notes and I'm sure you have some perspective here. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think we touched on a bunch of amazing topics and for the most part, if not all part, I think Max and I agree on a lot of the the principles and the way that we program, which is reassuring to say the least. Because in the end, you know, we we really don't have enough research to prove or disprove that what we're doing works or doesn't work, right? So, I I guess that the yeah. fact that uh, that another person who I admire and who's smart is doing similar things as I am and have similar philosophies is is reassuring. Love it. Who is that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much of course so i think i think at this point uh it might be apt to open the floor and 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 if there's any kind of closing comments or maybe we'll frame it this way if there's any closing advice that you can each give to athletes or coaches who are out there who are looking to be multi-sport strength athletes either competitively or non-competitively um what, what would that be what are some of the key points that, that they might need to know um, I would say, first and foremost, pay attention to technique. I think that's one of the most important things. You know, you 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 really can't try to get stronger if you don't have technique down, and that's particularly important for Olympic weightlifting, at least if if that's that's their goal. Um, so hire a coach. Make sure that you that you know how to move first. Um, and secondly, you know, put yourself out there. Stay open to to other ideas, training philosophies keep your eyes peeled, observe how other people are training and try to gather as much information as you can because ultimately you are the only one who has all the answers. You know, I think a lot of people rely way too much on their coaches and naturally, okay, I, you can place some trust on them, but ultimately you know what's working, what's not working, and only you can tell how you're feeling. So, yeah, I, I would say, uh, I would say, you know, the, the simplest thing is maybe, you know, the, the first thing you want to do is try to try to decide what it is you actually want to get out of what you're going to do. Um, you know, and, and if it's like if you're unsure of that, that's fine. It's OK to not want one thing in particular, but maybe try to narrow it down and get an idea. It's like, hey, what is it that I'm, that I'm trying to do with all this? And then develop a process oriented approach where your focus is on doing really good work day to day, doing the little things well, paying attention to the stuff that's important right in front of you, you know, when you're doing it. Don't worry about the the numbers and the goals and the long-term stuff, because if you do the little stuff well every day, at the very least, if you don't hit your goals, you'll enjoy that you did a really good job of the things you did. And ultimately you're well, probably so you're probably gonna hit your goal anyway. So I love it. And there, there's a lot of research on behavior and psychology to back up that focusing on the process actually helps you achieve your goals more so than the goals themselves. Um, so, yeah, I just want to I want to thank you both for your perspectives. And I want to thank you both for the work you continually do in our area and the good information you put out. Um, and uh, if folks want to learn more about uh, what you guys are doing, um, Steffi, where can they find you? You can find me at Steffi Cohen. That's it. Easy. Easy. Just big, just big dog in it. You know my name. You know where to find me. Come on, <laughs> Max. How about uh, you? You can find me uh, Max underscore in Ada at Instagram. Awesome. Well, the, once again, greatly appreciate uh, your guys' perspectives and your experience, uh, Omar. <laughs> for you, my friend. Eric, can I just offer one final piece of advice? Please. Yeah. And uh, uh, you're, you're the one I've been waiting for. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't listen to these two losers because it's actually all about West Side for life. 
Um, I knew I was immediately suspicious of both of you, uh, Max. You know, yeah, Abijay, if I train with the Bulgarian method, whatever. And Steffi, you might have some world records or whatever. But the fact that both of you don't use resistance bands in your weightlifting programming as accommodating resistance just makes me immediately suspicious of everything you've done. So I just, there's actually really three opinions here, Eric. So I just want to shoehorn that in at the end. But yeah, it, it was great having you guys. We'll we'll link everything in the description. Go ahead, follow them hybrid coaching good stuff if you want to leave a rating review on itunes it could help us out if you're on youtube go ahead and drop a comment we're here every single monday from now to eternity and we'll see you in the next one